Good morning, Dave. Hi, Annika. How you doing? Great, as Good. always. Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas. That's over. Oh, well, it was yesterday. Yeah, that, that, that's true. And by the time this is, people are seeing it. <clears throat> It'll be the be new year. July 4th. Yeah. Oh, I mean, maybe. Well, yeah. I'm really excited for episode six. I'm not even going to say any stupid comments. And I think we're just going to get right to it. How about that? That sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So in the, to it today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to where you're going to take us and what you're opening up here and how this theme continues to keep growing and uh, the conversations that you and I keep ending up in, even on the side yeah. um, from all these recordings. So uh, they're bringing me a lot of hope. And so I hope that also our listeners are sensing and feeling that too. Um, in the last episode, you introduced this idea that most first century <laughs> Jews had what you described as a kingdom of God expectation, along with this messianic hope. And you really started to open both of those up and describe why and how and um, the meaning behind some of those. These two expectations, these two pieces of hope that first century Jews had were rooted in the promise of the prophets. Mm -hmm. And as always, the context of their century old cycle of going into exile, which we've talked about for several episodes now. So when the hope, kingdom come, yeah, that would free them from the exile. Right. 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 So the hope and the expectation was that one day, very soon, the creator God, Israel's God, would break through into human history. And when he did everything wrong in the world would be made right. And I can feel that longing in my own heart, in my own soul. I talked about it last episode. Um, and this included the current Roman occupation um, and the exile that they were in. Um, so when Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom is at hand, he appeared and he drew a crowd because people's ears perked up. And mm -hmm. he, he got his little moment of uh, fame, not because the people believed that he was the Messiah necessarily, although some of them did, but, or, but because they also expected that someone was going to come and, and rescue them. And so they checked him out. Yep. But the problem was, and this is what you described last week, uh, the problem was that there were lots of opinions on how this kingdom would come and the way that this kingdom would be established. And you talked about those different ways last week. There's the way of Rome, which is power over. And then there's the way of the Zealots and the Herodians and the Pharisees and the Essenes. And then Jesus came with a different way, his way. And that was the problem because the way of Jesus confronted and contradicted, I mean, offensively <laughs> mm. yep every, every other way mm -hmm. and that's where we're going to land today and i know you have just a few thoughts maybe you've brought to the table here you've been working yeah. on this for a while uh, <clears throat> pick it up here yeah um it, it was not only offensive his way was uh kind of con confronting the other ways it was also to the ears of many just so unrealistic like this will never work uh, because it was it was the antithesis of the power over way. And so, yeah, I do have more to say. And, and most of it does have to do with these expectations you described regarding the nature of the kingdom and the way um, the kingdom of God actually operates and how um, all of that helps to explain what I want to start with today is this really weird but very consistent pattern in the ministry and life of Christ that as soon as I say this, you're going to remember this because it was it just happened over and over again. Where at first people were eager to follow, they were amazed at what he said. I mean, it starts in Matthew chapter four when he comes to the he starts calling out his disciples. Peter and Andrew were the first, and he says, "Come follow me." And immediately it says in chapter four of Matthew verse whatever it is, um, they did. They left their boats. They left their life. And um, they did it just like that. So they're almost archetypal examples of 
I'm going to follow this guy, see where it takes me. And it didn't take long for it to go way beyond a few fishermen who were mending their nets and following him. He started to draw crowds, as you mentioned, multitudes, in fact, by the end of chapter four. At the beginning of chapter four or middle of it, he's calling out Peter and Andrew, James and John. There's four. But now by the end of the chapter, multitudes are following him from all over Galilee and Decapolis, from Jerusalem to Judea and even beyond the Jordan. In other words, from all over the place, because at first people were amazed at what he said and what he did. And that response, you see that all through the Gospels, Mark 1, Matthew 4, Luke 4, Luke 20. But then the other part of the pattern was um, they would, just as quickly as they formed a crowd and started getting interested, they would fall away. Mm -hmm. they, they, would, they would withdraw from him. They would lose interest in him. And there were actually a number of reasons for that. <clears throat> I mean, sometimes it was because the cost of following him would be too high. Um, one of my sure. favorite stories is Matthew 8, described they're on the beach and the scribe says, a scribe who would be a good catch, if you will, someone of some stature following Jesus says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, that's great. But <laughs> foxes have holes, birds have nests, son of man has no place to lay his head. And if you follow me, it might be that way for you. And the guy disappears in the white space between verse 23 and 22. Four. So, so that's one reason they would fall away because the cost was too high. But the other reason was the, 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 the more primary reason was the one I'm going to talk about here. It was when he would begin to clarify, again, there's kingdom of God expectation. He's proclaiming the kingdom, but then he would begin to clarify what he meant by what he said about that, about the nature of the kingdom and the way the kingdom, as you said just earlier, would be established the way that it would work because there were, again, already established ways, like you mentioned, um, obviously the power over way of Rome. The zealots way was the antithesis of, well, no, it was the same as Rome's, but it was the rebellious way because we'll be safe and secure if we're in control and not them. And then there was the Herodians way, which was collaborating in the religious way of the Pharisees and the ultra-religious way of the Essenes. And we went into all of that last time. And Part of what they were doing when they were coming and liking him were, as you said, they were checking him out. And part of what they wanted to know was not is he right or wrong, but is he going to support our way? Is he going to be on our side, one of our guys? Because if he's on our side, we can use him, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but if he's not on our side and he's significant, like he has influence, he's going to be a threat. That's part of what we'll probably talk about a little bit more next time. Because the, he, he was a threat. And there's the rub, because the kingdom of which he spoke um, not only confronted, but sought to subvert, as you've already said, every other kingdom, every other way, be they personal kingdoms or political, religious, economic, not just Rome's uh, kingdom was he confronting, but the zealots too and the Pharisees too. So everybody who thought, yeah, I like it that he's confronting Rome, but he would confront them as well. And so he just made everybody mad. And almost every time he did that, clarified something like that, um, they would turn and begin to withdraw. Um, Palm Sunday is a, a classic picture of this, but it's kind of a big picture because it, it plays out over a week between Palm Sunday and then um, Good Friday. As he's entering Jerusalem, uh, the triumphant entry is what it's called to the shouts of Hosanna. Hosanna is a fascinating word. Sounds like praise. Praise you, praise you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that. Hosanna means literally save us now. And if you save us now the way we want you to save us, we've already talked about this, mm -hmm. go to heaven when they died. That wasn't on their mind. Save us now from this oppression and exile we're in. We'll crown you king. Uh, we'll bow and serve. And the crowning him king was symbolically said when they threw coats in the road, remember that? That yeah. was, you can walk on us if you want. And then the waving of the palm branches that we think is, isn't that cute? <laughs> and we make the, the kids do it. Um, What's that? We yeah. make all the kids do it in Sunday school. Yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah. I don't think we shouldn't do that, but it's just not what it meant. Because what it, what it communicated, he was, they were telling him the kind of king they wanted him to be. The palm branches were a symbol of, and a, and, a, and a hearkening back to the Maccabean Wars. There was a Jewish family called the Maccabees, and one of the sons 
um, had really formed an army and they had Jerusalem back um, mm -hmm. several hundred years before Jesus, because now they're in exile again. But like in their past, there was this Maccabean thing that represented men. That's when we had it going and the leader of that was called the hammer. And their symbol was a palm branch. I don't know why, but it was. So when they're waving palm branches, they're going, drop the hammer, drop the yeah. hammer. We think you're the king. And also Hosanna to the son of David is hearkening back to the kingdom of when 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 they were on top, when yeah. the kingdom of David was um their identity and they had their own identity. And so basically what I see, I've said this before. On Palm Sunday, as they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, what they're actually saying to him, son of David, we want all that stuff we used to have back is make Israel great again. Like, yeah. sorry, but it's like make it, America great again. And we don't care how, but what we expect is a hammer. That was the way they thought it was going to come, which is kind of disturbing when it comes in on the cult of a donkey. Um, um, and when they discovered again, I got to shorten this, <laughs> that it wasn't going to save them the way they wanted to be saved by powering over Rome. Um, and he made that pretty clear, pretty quick. It went from Hosanna, Hosanna to crucify him, crucify him. It went to give us Barabbas. Yeah. We don't want the way of Jesus. We want the way of Barabbas. And, and our last episode, I ended with that. Matthew 27, Pilate, this is at the trial of Jesus. Pilate gives the crowd a choice um, you can have Jesus or you can have Barabbas. They, they chose Barabbas. And it wasn't because they liked Barabbas. He's a nice guy. <laughs> Even that they disliked Jesus, though, by this time they kind of did. It was they wanted it. was so It's a symbolic or archetypal story because what they were saying, like eternally, 2000 years later, the message we hear when they say give us Barabbas is give us his way. Because that way of Jesus riding on a cult of a donkey and loving your enemy, that will never work. And so they rejected his way because his way will never work. Give us Barabbas, and I think we still do it in ways we know, in ways we don't know. I had an um, article, it's right here on my thingamajig in my office here, um, at, an, at an event called Turning, Turning Point USA um, event in Phoenix just last year. And this is an organization <clears throat> that's pretty much rooted in evangelical. It's, it's kind of um, meets in evangelical churches all over the place. It's designed to mobilize young conservative evangelicals. And Donald Trump Jr. was not Donald Trump, but the junior guy was the um, the keynote speaker at this thing. And for those who heard it, it's kind of he famously said, because this is this really went all over the place. Um, but basically, is if we're going to save America from the godless liberals, no argument about that. OK, fine. We have to play as dirty as them because and this is where he got my attention. Following Jesus command to turn the other cheek has gotten us nothing. It's gotten us nothing. He's, a, he's an incredible theologian, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> what? But what he's saying, he's right. If what you want is power over, if what you want is defeating the enemy, whoever you perceive the enemy to be, the oppressor to be, um, if it's about winning the culture wars and being on top, then, um, yeah, it won't get you anything. Jesus' way won't get you what you want, Donald Trump Jr., promise me. Yeah. So here's the deal about that. <clears throat> I really had to process that because, you know, I'm looking, I'm gonna just, want to just I wanted to use power over on his face. Anyway, <laughs> I, I didn't. Now, here's the deal. That that he said that did not surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, um, it didn't even particularly bother me because that's who he is. It's um, That is his way. I, that's what I would expect him to say. Mm -hmm. What bothered me and what I didn't expect was where this was spoken um, was to evangelicals, kids, teenagers, you know, older, younger adults, Several thousand of them stood to cheer at that, <clears throat> as if to say what he just said um, is entirely consistent with the ways of Jesus, because they were all evangelical Christians. So that's, it didn't, I don't know what went through every person's mind, but in my mind, I'm going, you have no idea how incredibly inconsistent. What you're cheering is the antithesis 
of the gospel mm-hmm. and you're calling yourself evangelical Christians. And this is where the book started for me and my lament. Um, because I think the church is in exile, like we've lost the story. When you're cheering that, you've lost the story. You're you're not yeah. in the story of God. Um, and it raises this question: what in God's name is going on there? Um uh and what i think is going on is that we have developed a christian culture and i talked about this with the robert jeffers quote quote as well um on sunday morning uh we'll invite people to accept jesus as their personal savior so they'll go to heaven when you die which is a truncated version of the gospel but if you're going to win the culture wars give us barabbas so i think i don't know if every kid there but if picture a whole couple thousand evangelicals in their hearts, when I love Jesus, I'm fine with Jesus, and I accept him as my own personal savior, but if we're gonna win the culture world, give us what uh, Donald Trump Jr. just said. That is what gets me, like, we could actually do it that way. Give me Barabbas, is, is what they're saying, because it's 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 like you're down to, like, a pragmatic approach, because the way of Jesus won't work. How, how am I going to control? How are we going to be on top? And win yeah. if we don't you if we use that Jesus way again, which brings me back to this pattern that at first when Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom, he seemed to check all the boxes. People are going, yeah, this guy miracles. He's talking about the kingdom. Um, he's feeding five thousand. He checks all the boxes, and people were amazed until he clarified what he meant about what he mm-hmm. said about the nature of the kingdom and the way of the kingdom. Because the kingdom of which he spoke would not be established by muscling up, by being the biggest, the loudest, the strongest, the richest, by using power over, not by grasping, but by releasing, not by ascending, but by descending, Philippians 2, not by winning, but by losing your life, will you find it? What? 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 He said that, at least be curious, for I have come not to be served but to serve and to give my life. Mm. Not to take yours, but to give my life. Ransom for many, four scriptures. Uh, I want to unpack just really quickly. Four texts that will kind of establish this as foundational. Maybe help us, you know, jump in the next episode. The first is John 18. Um, uh, One is, I'll just start with John 18. Jesus said before Pilate, you know the, the scene, it's the trial of Jesus. And Jesus uh, Pilate asked him this question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, there's some back and forth weird stuff. But he says, basically, I am. For this I was born, for this I came into this world, he says in John 18, verse 37. But my kingdom is not of this realm. It is not of this world. It's in the world, but it's not of this world. It's not like the kingdoms of this world. For if it was, verse 36, and this is the key, um, if it wasn't um, of the kingdom of this world, my servants would be fighting. Um, Mm -hmm. Had I not be delivered, because we had to win. And if so if my kingdom was of, of that kingdom, that's what our strategy would be to power up, to fight. Um... In other words, my servants would be trying to win this thing the way the kingdoms of this world try to win these things by being bigger, stronger, louder, faster with a power over method. But as it is, my kingdom will not be established on earth that way ever, ever. Mm. And sometimes when he said that, people would go, I'm out of here. They would just, it was so, can you see a crowd? Like you could be on the edge of the crowd going, <laughs> well, well, you say something weird and you just go, eh. you don't even think about it anymore. You just check them off. Yeah. It just happened over and over. Second text, Matthew 20. I love this one. I think there's four places in the Gospels where the, and there are different times in the story where the gospel, where the the, um, disciples are arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. But this is the funniest one, I think, uh, because they're arguing about who's the greatest. And this time, the mother of James and John comes up to Jesus in verse 21. The mother of James and John. Not James and John, but they got their mom. Going, mm-hmm. <laughs> and she says, command that in your kingdom, my two sons sit on your right and on your left. Stop right there. What does it tell you about her perception of the kingdom? Right and left are positions of power. And whatever view she had of his kingdom, she believed it. Okay, mm-hmm. She was 
believe in it, but her whatever her version of the kingdom was, I want my sons to have a place of influence and power, um, which means she didn't get it. Um, the very next verse says the disciples were really ticked off because they were cut into the front of the line anyway. <laughs> but basically, Jesus ignores her. If you just look at the text in verse 25, he kind of ignores her and <clears throat> pulls his disciples in and has one of these interesting talks. And he says, this is like a famous line of his, but giving you the context I just gave you makes it come alive to me anyway. You guys, you, you know how um, rulers of the Gentiles operate. Um, how they lord it over, power over. That's how they do it. That's the way to do it in the kingdoms of this world. And you, and you know how they're great men. Make America great again. I, we got to spend an episode talking about what do you mean by great? We talk mm -hmm. about anyway. <laughs> and how they're great men exercise authority over them um, because that's their way. Uh, power over. Verse 26, it is not to be so among you. No end of discussion. It, that's not how we do it here. Um, we're doing it a different way. Forever wishes to be great. And then he says these weird circular and everybody's head is spinning. For whoever wishes to be great must first become the servant of all. Okay, what? And whoever wishes to be first shall be the slave of all. What? D designed to, 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 it was designed to stir them up and mess them up and make them wonder what in the world this is an absolute opposite way of thinking, yeah. being in the world, and 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 we'll never win this way. But then he adds this, because even the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, came not to be served, which is what I want. I want to have, you know, I want to get it so I'm on top again, mm -hmm. but to serve and to give his life, a ransom for many. Third text, John 13. Um, this is the Last Supper. Uh, Jesus is with his disciples, and it says in verse 1, knowing that his hour had come, his hour of suffering, he was about to go to the cross, and knowing that Judas would betray him, Peter would deny him, all of his disciples would leave him uh, and, and abandon him. Knowing all of that, I love this, he got up from the meal, verse 4, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured, a wa poured water into a basin, then knelt down and washed the disciples' feet and dragged them with a the towel, which means he took the towel off. Okay, get the picture. I mean, um, th th what he did there, what, we, we, we so romanticized that washing. Mm -hmm. We have wash, feet washing ceremonies, which are very meaningful. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. But um, what he's doing right now there is what a slave would do, um, not a king. <laughs> You're... That's not what a king does. That's what a slave does because kings don't wear towels. <laughs> they wear ro royal robes and mm -hmm. they don't bow down at people's feet. They have people bow down to theirs and, and they don't do the work of the slave. They have slaves. That's how you prove you're in control. You have people under you. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think, and by the next part of the story uh, where he's washing their feet, I don't know if you remember the part it's pretty significant where, where Peter says, no, I, he wouldn't let Jesus wash his feet. That You will never wash my feet. Um, I don't want any part of this. Jesus rebukes him. Um, but I think the reason Peter didn't want him to wash his feet is because he wanted a different kind of king. Mm. And I, I take comfort in that. Yeah. I, I'm just oddly um, encouraged by that because so do I. I mean, I, I, Peter's so easy to pick on. Yeah. But, but it's me. It's you. I, I, I want God to do it different. I want him to roll over. I want him to roll over all the bad guys. He wanted a different kind of king, and he wanted a different kind of kingdom. And do that, man, I don't want to get into this deeply, but how alone Jesus was at the end, because nobody got it. Mm. After three years of pouring, nobody around him, closest to him, still understood it um he wanted a different kind of kingdom where we wear the royal robes um not towels where we are served we don't serve where we're bowed down to not um we don't bow 
downward. We're on top and we get our way and we win. And when he took off his towel to dry their feet, he was he was as humiliated as you can get. I mean, he's just buck naked. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing? That is not what prophets spoke. And sometimes they mm -hmm. did prophetic acts. This was a prophetic act because what he was doing in this was this is what I'm calling you to. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just wash their feet. It's to humble yourself and to bow, to serve and to wow, wow. You know, this isn't going to give me what I want. Right? Yeah. Uh, I hate that. Matthew 26, last one. Uh, Jesus is arrested. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know the story. Well, Peter pulls out a sword. I love Peter. He's so great. <laughs> Keeps screwing up the way I would. <laughs> yeah. Just pull out a sword, huh? Me yeah. too. <laughs> Me too, yeah. He doesn't just pull out his sword. He swings it. He does. I don't know how he, you know, it says he cut off the slave's ear. How do you do that? It's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think he went like this and the guy ducked. I don't know any other way to do it. So he swung the sword, um, well intended, like I'm defending Jesus, but that's mm -hmm. the only way he knew. So now I have grace for the thousand of evangelicals who stood che cheering that idiot, Donald Trump Jr. Sorry, I didn't mean to call him an idiot. <laughs> I did. But anyway, um, because he he didn't get it. And then Jesus says to him in verse 25, um, uh, this is my paraphrase, you idiot. <laughs> now he says, put away the sword, Peter. Two reasons. I love this. Verse 53. One, um, first of all, Peter, do not do you not know that I have at my disposal 12,000 legions of angels? Which means this, that if I was going to do the power over thing, which is not my way, but if I was, I wouldn't use your puny <laughs> little sword. I wouldn't use you. I wouldn't use what? Put away the sword. Um, if we were going to do it that way, I would call on my father and he would um, take care of the second reason. Verse 52, if you take up the sword that way, if that's going to be your way, power over, and not just with the sword, but yelling louder and being bigger and fatty, and we're going to fight dirty and whatever, uh, whatever means necessary, <clears throat> uh, you'll die by it. Uh, and a couple of reasons that that's true. One, whenever you use that power over way, there's always escalation. Now, we may mm -hmm. talk about it down the road, and you and I have talked about this in other episodes. Mm -hmm. Samson, remember, they, yeah. it would, the, 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 the cycle was always you hit me hard, I hit you harder. Um, mm -hmm. You poke out one eye, I poke out both. Um, mm -hmm. Even that that law that sounds barbaric, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that sounds, oh, that's barbaric. No, that was actually a, a way to, to bring things in because everybody was escalating. Now, if you cut off someone's hand, well, you're just going to cut off your hand to try to make it even more civil. But that's one of the reasons um, you, you'll, you'll die by it because there's this escalation. But the other reason is that there's always someone with a bigger sword. You, if you're going to do that power over way, there's someone who's got more power. That's why mm -hmm. some people who have power are hanging on to it desperately and they'll do anything to keep it. But there's always someone with a faster sword, more swords, more votes, a bigger, faster, louder bottom line in the kingdom of God, the way we fight and the way we win. The path to power is not by picking up a sword, <clears throat> but by taking up a cross. Wait, 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 now I'm back in the story. And I hate this. I know this. I hate this too. I know. I know. Uh, it's not by cutting off the enemy's ears. It's by healing them. That's what Jesus did to that guy's ear. By loving them enough to die for them. What? Shut up. What? No, you read it in Sunday school. He did it because he did it for me. No, but we're called to, we're called to that as well. Because the primary way that the purposes of God are advanced in the world that the kingdom of God is established in the world, that the face of God is revealed to the world is not by power of the sword, but the, by the power of the cross. It is not with power over methodology, but with power under by supernatural sacrificial love, even for an enemy, for it was while we were yet sinners, parentheses, enemies of God, Christ died for us.
Okay. So this message of the way the kingdom comes at Open Door, even and Annika, you've heard me talk about this a lot, <clears throat> actually became so central to our way of thinking and understanding of the gospel that it became part of the language we used. I, I found notes from 20 plus years ago to articulate the vision of our church. Um, and we said something like this, that we want to become the kind of people, becoming the kind of people is transformation. So this is going to require transformation. Who are having a kingdom of God effect in our community, in our city, in our schools, uh, around the tables, um, with our friends. And by the way, every church would say that. We want to have a kingdom of God effect. Okay, mm -hmm. It's not going to be by declaring ourselves the moral majority. I was pushing on that back in the day. And the moral majority doesn't just imply this was the approach. Because there's more of us, we're the majority. Because there's more of us than them, we win. The problem is, if you win it, that we're the majority and we're going to win, uh, you lose. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you lose. And here's the principle. Whenever you use a kingdom of this world method, which is we're bigger, we're louder, we're faster, we're stronger, um, to, to accomplish what you actually believe is a kingdom of God um, outcome. If you use a kingdom of this world method to do it, you lose the kingdom of God altogether. Yeah. You lose what Paul called the fragrance of Christ. Because mm. you might have won, you know, the argument, um, but you lost the kingdom. I, this, this is the context for that. This is weird. My kids were in junior high. So that's Sherry Meyer was your gym teacher. I shouldn't have said Sherry Meyer. I didn't ask her permission for this. Sorry. Um, no, she was also a teacher there at Mabelville Junior High. And there was a big thing that I remember this when it got all, all sorts of people were getting all upset and angry about the sex education at the school. And James Dobson was telling everybody um, about what they were teaching and, and, um, they and if that's what they were doing, then that was really bad. But the problem was, and so they they didn't storm the the, the school board meeting, but they got really big, this huge contingent of evangelical Christians on the school board, and were fighting this thing and telling them what they were teaching. And the problem was that Sherry uh, knew what they were teaching because she taught it, and they didn't teach. So one, they were lying or uninformed. And two, they were using the power over thing. And I don't think they won. But if they had, they would have lost because they lost everything. The people on the board thought they were like, wow, now I want now I want to be part of that tribe. I want to run as far from those people. Anytime you use a kingdom of this world method to accomplish a kingdom of God outcome, you lose the kingdom entirely. You, I hate that. And by the way, this isn't, I mean, that's a little interesting, maybe like close to home story about maybe a little junior high, but history is clear on this. And um, first century church, the experience of the first century church right after Christ for uh, almost 400 years, the Christians were mar marginalized and persecuted. Every disciple died a martyr's death. Wasn't that great? No, it was horrible. Um, um, but the witness of their transformation, even in the middle of them being um, persecuted and marginalized, literally turned the world upside down. It, it changed the world. Like Christianity exploded. They couldn't stop it um, because the, the, these, the, these, they were doing it a different way and not winning, but winning. The king of God was spreading. In 312 AD, you probably know this part of the story, the Roman emperor, uh, Constantine, converted. Mm. Good news for Christians. No, He's a it, crazy lunatic. <laughs> it, yeah. It, 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 what, what he had was a, a dream, a vision. He was about to go to battle, and it was a vision of Jesus and a cross or something or other. And out of that vision, he he ended up putting on his shields. I think it was the two first the two first letters of the word Christ in Greek, mm -hmm. like an X or a cross, and he put those yep. on the shield. And so now he was going to go, and he brought it into battle in Jesus name and he won the battle. And so he converted to Christianity. Christianity was then legalized, no more persecution if you were a Christian. It soon became the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire and Holy Roman Empire 
was now connected to the Roman Catholic Church, the mm-hmm. universal church. Um, I'm not picking on Catholics there. That's more Roman. But but here we are now. We have a place of power. Now we're winning. Their slogan um, became the church militant and triumphant. So for the first time um, uh, in history, this power under kingdom had power over status. Mm -hmm. And guess what they did with it? (laughs) How they used it? They used it to crush um, everybody who opposed them. That's how they used the power over status in Jesus' name. So what in Jesus' name is going on there? They used it. Um, to establish a Christian version of empire, yeah, and that gives me chills because I think we, I think a lot of people, without knowing it, are fighting for a Christian version of empire. So we're on top and we're in control, and we'd be better if we weren't. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend Kenty, the California pastor, <clears throat> um, did a talk at Open Door years ago called, called "The End of Christendom." I remember it that and he made a distinction between Christianity and Christendom Mm -hmm. and um, Christendom has to do with kingdom like like power having empire Mm -hmm. and he was declaring at the time the end of Christendom now this was several years ago and that that was actually good news because we've really never been able from a position of power we've never done very well ever at communicating the grace message of God from a position of power but under some of what's going on politically now, we got a chance to get back to the table. And um, that thing, Christendom thing, is um, um, possible again. And it means that, and then to me, it makes the evangelicals' response to him a huge step backwards. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we've lost ground. Whatever, whatever thing we think we've won in the courts, the 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 let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The first thing people see that's first. That's not the first thing people see. Um, Emma Green, the Atlantic Monthly, wrote that article. I don't know if I mentioned it in the first thing, but the name of God was everywhere. Remember that? <clears throat> oh, yep. You did. And the idea that the name of God would be everywhere, anywhere, would be a wonderful life giving thing. But she was talking about. I don't know if she was a Christian or not, but she, her, what she noticed, among other things, was at the. Um, um, storming of the Capitol, the name of God was there. There was Jesus Save signs right next to the gallows. There was music playing uh, that was talking about the power of God to defeat all enemies. Christian flags next to Confederate flags. There was one guy who, when they stormed and got into the um, the the Capitol, the, the chamber, somebody did a prayer, and in Jesus' name, they saw it was all in Jesus' name. Um, and and I, uh, there are some who kind of you know, look at those pictures and go, that's just a lunatic fringe. Okay, that, that makes me feel better. If they're just a bunch of loonies, oh, it's an aberration. The, they were all um, imposters. It was Antifa posing as Christians to make Christians look bad. I've heard all that. Um, uh, but I read too much. There, there's a thing called the Jericho March. The Jericho March actually gives evidence to the contrary that these were all um, a lunatic fringe because in the days leading up to the siege of the Capitol, thousands of evangelical Christians gathered at the National Mall for this reenactment of, of Jericho. Where remember in the Old Testament, people walked around the, the, the walls yeah. of Jericho seven times and then the walls came tumbling down. I sang that in Sunday school. Um, Russell Moore, who's a longtime evangelical leader, was with the Southern Baptist Convention, is presently the uh, editor-in-chief at Christianity Today, uh talks about the fact that 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 Jericho March was one of the key speakers at that event was again named Eric Metaxas, um, who was Christian radio host, featured speaker at National Prayer Breakfast for a very long time. He believed absolutely that uh now I'm gonna get into some weird water here, but hang with me. Believed that the election had been stolen and should be overturned. Let me say something about that. Fine. Okay, you can believe that. I don't I I don't you could, maybe you're right. I don't care. Um, what where I care is he was willing to overturn it by whatever means necessary, including violence. Here's a quote: "I'd be happy to die in this fight." This guy Metaxas said, "This is a, 
fight for everything. So we need to fight to the death, to the last drop of blood, because it's worth it. Again, believe what you want about the election being stolen. Okay. Um, the fighting to death, to the last drop of blood, including maybe yours, <laughs> uh, raises this question, what in God's name is going on there? That's got to be thought through. That's got to be thought through um, because it was in God's name he was willing to fight to the last drop of blood. And I hear Jesus saying to Peter, put away your sword. Eric, Texas, I love you. Put away your sword, dude. Um, if I was going to do it that way, I wouldn't use your rope. <laughs> Sadly, now I'm quoting Russell Moore. Uh, for large sectors of American evangelicalism, that kind of violence, if necessary, thinking is not an aberration. Um, that far from cooling off, a large number of evangelicals continue to believe that the 2020 election was stolen by a vast left-wing conspiracy. Fine, maybe it was, maybe it was. And, and this is the, that violence might be justified in the days to come. Um, and that's where we're off the rails. <laughs> that's where we're off the, we're off the rails lost the story. Um, so in God's name is going on there. Let me end with what we started with in the very first episode. There was a cycle that the people of God went through from beginning to the end. They would forget who they were and whose they were and why they were here. And they'd lose the story. And every time they did, they'd go into exile of some sort. They would lose their way. And they were, whatever else they were incapable of doing was the mission God had put them on this earth to do, and that was to reveal the face of God, for no man has seen God at any time. But if we reflect the life and character of God, they might get a glimpse. Now you're back on mission. Mm -hmm. and it can't be done with a sword. So that's happening. <laughs> Justice. <laughs> so where this takes me which I've already told you um I think you I think all these conversations might put me into a midlife crisis of some sort <laughs> I mean I am turning 40 this year yeah. well okay in 2023 I'm turning 40 and so it'd be right on time for me um I feel like I've also ridden this roller coaster with you even just in this episode of strong emotion I go from feeling my own desire my deep desires especially in my relationships but my deep desires for my kids and my work life and my home life and my marriage there are things that I want and I am willing to fight for and but ultimately it is my way that I'm fighting for hmm. um and you and I have started to talk about like, so how do, how do we find Jesus way? How do we live out Jesus way in our, in our, in our life? How do we, how do we steer away from this power over, but still have a boundary, put, put, put food on my table, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Still love my kids and fight, fight for them in the systems right. that they are living in. Um, right. In the public school system, in the, what, whatever places that you find you're raising kids in. It, it right. is complicated. It was complicated when you did. It's complicated now that I'm doing it a couple of decades later, right? Um, is it okay? And to, how do we? Oh, go ahead. Well, is it okay to have a boundary? Is it okay to yeah. say no? Is it okay? Um, you know, one of the phrases I've used, and maybe we'll get into it next week. When the culture spits nails, can we spit nails back? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but not, and you can't do that and reflect the image of Christ, but can you protect your kids? And how, right. yeah, yeah, how, how, how do, and some of the sexual stuff, I brought up sexual stuff um, um, earlier in the, something that happened in Mabel Grove Junior High 20 years ago or something like that. And it might've been an entirely different environment. And I think right. it was a different environment. Um, uh, so, so, so this, yes, this doesn't mean passive. This is, right. doesn't lead to passivity, but it, but we really, I mean, it's really helpful to, if I can make people do it, just sit in this, sit in, yeah. in this this way. Um, and and in this, like, what is the, at Open Door, we've talked a lot about this third way. There's this way yeah. over here way, and there's this way over here way. And both those 
the, the, the radical left, the radical right, you know what they are is they're both, they both think they're right. Yeah. <laughs> and both, they do fight dirty. It's win at all costs. What's, what's the third way? What, what's the, what's the way that does truth and grace? Yeah. Grace without truth. Oh, I just think you're wonderful. There's no truth there. No, I don't think you're wonderful. I don't think that's healthy. And you are doing damage, and I'm going to stop that. Yeah. Um, but truth without grace is just a hammer. And and we we do tend to go to those extremes. And so yeah. that's where we'll keep moving. But this is like, I think somehow we laid down some whew, foundational things about the way of Jesus. And even I think those p- passages make it pretty clear one and take some comfort the disciples didn't get it they would maybe get it for a while and then they lose it good so, so that gives you space to do the same it's not okay but yeah 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 we're all human okay yeah um, and and the other was jesus didn't budge <laughs> he didn't he didn't no okay i guess in this case we can beat the crap out of him yeah <laughs> But I, I love I love how you're clarifying. It doesn't mean apathy. It doesn't mean passivity. It doesn't. It's not that Jesus never got angry. It's not that Jesus never stood up for what was right or didn't nope. confront uh, the things that were wrong that he was, you know, seeing out in the world, encountering that were being done to him. It just was a like you said a different way, mm-hmm. um, a re- a way unrecognizable to the people around him. So much so that people fled when you were talking about you know these crowds that he attracted i thought oh it the way to talk about that in in modern language is like he was trending he was he was so popular (laughs) like his hashtags on twitter we were trending for sure he went viral and then he he went viral yeah Mm -hmm. he went viral and then the crowd dissipated right once he started to say the things that really mattered and to cl- and to clarify what what his mission really was and what he was here to do and what his way meant um i would have i would have been one of those that unfollowed really quick <laughs> well one of the things i love about this this a lot of this stuff came out of that series i did years ago called the way of the rabbi i remember right. the language of that was so rich and it, and it kind of kept us in this thing this, this way of thinking for a very long time. But it was one of the times that it, it dawned on me that there are just all people all over the place, evangelicals. Okay, that's our tribe. So I'm picking on evangelicals. I know you love to pick on the evangelicals. Because I am one. Because I am one. And that's in my tribe. So, yeah. but, but who, who, um, who loved Jesus, accepted him, into, and have no intention, it doesn't even, because this is not the gospel they heard, yeah. of following his way. Um, they don't even know what that means. Mm-hmm. Um, um, because if they did, they wouldn't be buying this crap. Yeah. What's his face over there? Yeah, and there's so much, there's so much crap to buy. There's so mm-hmm. much religious crap to buy right now, right? It is a dime a dozen it's everywhere. It's in the newspapers. It's it's all it's everywhere. Um and it is hard to discern what is actually the way of Jesus and what is the way of the crowd, the way of Barabbas, the way all there's so many ways. Um and and again, like I said, we have access to so many voices and yep. so many ways. Um so well, I, I'm excited to see where and and what we unpack next. Uh, it sounds like you have a plan of maybe where where we'll head next. But um, well, I, I just wrote down. I mean, a, a question out of this that might be worth answering because <clears throat> there's a number of ways to go. Um, but do, so, in light of Jesus' way that doesn't pick up his sword, we just lay down. Do we just doormats for Jesus? Is that what we? <laughs> do? Um, um, so let's talk about that. We'll talk about, um, yeah, yeah, next time. All right. Well, uh, until we see you again, friends and listeners, uh, feel free to leave us a comment or a message. We love reading them. Uh, They've been delightful to see. So until then, until episode seven, we will uh, see you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Dave. Bye-bye. Thanks.